Welcome, 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 everyone. Um, this is very, very exciting, and we're happy to be here. Uh, we are here with Denver Film and the University of Denver, and my name is Halisi Vinson. I am the Executive Director of the Colorado Democratic Party, and we have an amazing uh, panel uh, assembled here to talk about um, John Lewis and making good trouble and um, his life in context of today's events and what we know um, today that we might not have known two months ago. And so with that, I'm gonna kick it off and I'm gonna ask the first question just to kind of get the discussion started and to introduce you to our amazing panel. In the meantime, um, you will be able to ask questions as well. So put your questions in the chat and those questions will be filtered to me and we will ask your questions. So let's get started. And I think uh, panelists, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask the question and then I will introduce you prior to you answering it as opposed to reading all of the bios at once. Um, and I'm not gonna read the whole bio because otherwise that would be the whole thing. We have an amazing <laughs> panel that's done a lot. So I'm gonna start with Mr. Mejia. And the question that I, I want to start with is what do you believe panel John Lewis wanted us to take away from that film, Good Trouble? Let's start there. What was the takeaway? What, why was it made? What should we learn? What should we know? And what should we be thinking about as we move forward? And so the first person to answer that question is going to be James Mejia. And, um, if you already know who he is, then just sit tight here because there's some things you might not know. Uh, James Mejia is the CEO of Denver Film. Formerly, he was the managing partner of Pan American Business Services, helping private firms interact with government and servicing as strategists to initiatives and candidate political campaigns. Mr. Mejia led and managed some of the city's most complex and challenging agencies when he was working for Denver. Um, he led a capital project, including leading the construction of the 425 million Denver Justice Center. And he was a project manager and completed a 50% expansion of Denver's urban, P, uh, urban park acreage as manager of Denver Parks and Recreation. He served as an at-large school board member where he served from 1999 to 2003 and was named founding CEO of the Denver Preschool Project that has assisted thousands of Denver families in making sure their children get a healthy start. James is a father to three girls. Moya, a student at East High School, eyeing colleges on the East Coast, which was very impressive, as well as her GPA, so maybe you'll mention that, James. Alexandra, who plays cello and lacrosse at South High School, and Riley, who is a beast on the soccer pitch. The Mejia family likes to visit Denver's many ice cream shops, as we all do. So, James, what do you think the biggest takeaway uh, that the congressman wanted us to take away from that film? Yeah, well, Halisi, thank you for, uh, for, for moderating and um, a, a pleasure to serve with all the panelists um, on, on this on this panel today, you know, there, there, there was one quote in the film. I'm sorry. Oh, that was my computer uh, oh, thinking okay. that we were talking to her. So I will mute that. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, so there, there was one, one quote uh, from, from John Lewis that struck me more than anything else. And, and he said that, that there are forces today that are trying to take us back to another time and another dark period. And we're not going to let them do that. And, and to me, I, I, I think what the call is in the film is this is the history and the struggle of the civil rights movement um, that has provided the foundation on which we are standing and fighting today. And a reminder that at any point, if you are not involved in the democracy, that there is always the possibility that the democracy will slip to a place that it, it is is another dark period, as, as uh, Congressman Lewis would 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 have put it. Um, and so I, th I think he wanted to remind us to be ever vigilant uh, that that democracy is something that we have to work hard to sustain. 
indeed, indeed, it's not guaranteed. Um, our next young pan youngest panelist, I'm going to say, um, the rest of us are old fogies, is Uma uh, Trivedi. Did I pronounce that right, Uma? I should have asked you yesterday. Great. Uma is currently finishing up her master's degree in international human rights at the Joseph Corbell School for International Studies at the University of Denver, where she is focusing on food security and gender equity with a regional focus on South and Southeast Asia. At Corbell, she is involved with leading the Corbell Students of Color group, uh, serves as Dean's Advisory Committee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and works with the Corbell DEI officer to implement inclusive programming. Outside of Corbell, she is involved in several student-led activism efforts across campus. Alongside her schoolwork, Uma is the Development and Communications Associate at the Women's Bakery, a social enterprise that gainfully employs women and provides uh, access to quality bread in East Africa. Originally from Seattle, Uma is first generation and comes from a working class South Asian family. Uma graduated from Whitman College in 2017 with a bachelor's degree in anthropology and religious studies. And so Uma, what would you say uh, the biggest takeaway for you was? Thank you so much for that introduction, Felici. Um, and just in the spirit of healing and um, recognizing that I'm in Denver, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the original peoples of the land, um, which are the Northern and Southern Arapaho and Northern and Ara uh, Southern Cheyenne peoples. Um, and thank you so much. I think um, the biggest takeaway for me is a quote that um, Congressman Lewis says in the very beginning is that um, you know, we've made so much progress in this movement, but we have many miles to go. And I think, um, especially the events that have taken place over the last uh, few years, um, that shows that there's energy and there's movement. Um, and we just really have to hone in on that and build the community and keep the movement going. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And it's hard sometimes to recognize progress when there's still so far to go, right? Uh, we're going to do boy, girl, boy, girls, what I, what I figured. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dean Mayer. Um, Frederick Fritz uh, Mayer is Dean of Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. Uh, Mr. Or Dean Mayer has led efforts to launch a new Master's of Public Policy degree at the Scri um, Scrivener Institute of Public Policy establish a new master's degree and research program in global environmental sustainability, whoop, whoop. create a new institute for comparative and religious and, and regional studies, orient the school's research and teaching towards engagement with the great issues facing the world today, and prioritize diversity and inclusion in recruiting of faculty, staff, and students in the curriculum and in the culture of the Corbell School. Mayor's research addresses global, past research addresses globalization and its effects, with particular emphasis on the labor and environmental impacts and economic integration. He has also written um, several books, one including the interpretation of NAFTA, the art and science of political analysis. Prior to his appointment at Denver, uh, Mayor was professor of public policy political science and environment, and environment, and an associate dean for strategy and engagement at Duke University. In addition to his academic experience, Mayer served as senior international trade and foreign policy advisor to former U.S. Senator Bill Bradley from 92 to 93. Mayer received an A.B. in history and literature from Harvard College and an MPP and a Ph.D. in public policy, both from John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. So do I call you Dr. Dean Mayer? Uh, Fritz will do, but uh, okay. <laughs> I think that's good enough. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction and just delighted to be with all of you and uh, what, what, a, what a treat uh, to be able to do this. Uh, um, I actually grew up in Atlanta, uh, so one part of my biography that's not there uh, in, you know, in the in the 60s, I mean, I came of age in the 60s, uh, went to all white schools and segregated uh, Atlanta schools until 1969. And so, and John Lewis was my uh, congressman. Uh, and uh, I actually wow. had a chance to meet him then and, and then later in life as well. So wonderful, just personally, just very meaningful for me to be part of this. Uh, thank you. 
Um, well, I mean, I, I think uh, both James and Uma uh, had it right. I mean, he, this, this is a call to action, uh, as indeed his whole life was a call to action. The thing that always struck, struck me about Lewis is, is how he, he used his own story, uh, which he told over and over again, from the chicken story to the story of Selma to the, the boy from Troy. He, I, I've heard it many times, and, but he, he understood the power of, of that story as, as, a, uh, as a, a story of, of struggle and of determination and of progress. Um, and you know what, what's so extraordinary about him was he was struck down like physically over and over in his life. And he, he just got back up and mm -hmm. kept going. And I think that's that was a message. It was a it's it's a call to action. And the alarm, you know, we, this is fragile democracy, and progress is fragile. And there are forces out there that are pushing back as we speak. I mean, there was a Supreme Court case today that was argued on the Voting Rights Act that would further narrow the reach of the Voting Rights Act. And so, he, he you know, he he is um, through his example, I think, calling us all to action. Uh, to say you can't, you know, this is fragile, this could s slip away, and, and it requires all of us, to, maybe not, you know, most none of us are as brave as that man, um, but to, to do what we can uh, uh, to, to advance the struggle, because the alternative is, is um, you know, is the possibility quite real that we, that we, we slip back, and uh, he was, there's a level of determination about him it just comes through every, if you if you ever met him or saw him speak, you know, that, that just absolute determination and toughness. Um, and so that, that, that to me is, is, you know, what he was trying to do in this film, call us to action and steal us for the battle. Yeah, indeed, indeed, which, which will lead to my next question after I get to the honorable <laughs> Albert Wedgworth. And, um, and for all of you who don't recognize our former president of our city council, because she looks so young with her new hairstyle, she is the Honorable Elbra Wedgworth and is a proud East Denver native. Her professional experience in the private and public sector spans more than 30 years. Elbra is the only person in recent memory who has served in all three branches of the Denver city government city council and audit auditor's office and the mayor's office. Prior to her election to city council, she worked as the director of philanthropic and government affairs at Denver Health and Hospital Authority, where she reinstated the board of directors and launched the new newly formed Denver Health Foundation. Elbra spearheaded Denver Health to be approved in the 20, for the 2017 general obligation bond initiative by Denver voters for 75 million to build the Denver Health Outpatient Medical Center. Elbra, prior to that, Elbra served as the president and chair of the board for the Denver 2008 Democratic National Convention Host Committee for the Historic Democratic National Convention. I added some words in there. But the last political convention in the Rocky Mountain region was 100 years prior. So this was an extraordinary feat uh, to bring the convention here. In September 2008, she was elected unanimously as the president of the Denver Union Station Project Authority Board of Directors, Board of Directors and served nine terms as the board president from 2008 through 2017. Now, mind you, she was doing that and the convention at the same time, so the 500 million Denver Union Station Project opened May 2014 on time and under budget, thanks to Ms. Wells, uh, Wedgworth's uh, leadership. Elbra was the first person of color to serve as the chairperson for the Downtown Denver Partnership, Inc. in their 60 year history. She held that role from 2013 to 2014 and was later named the Downtown Denver Partnership Honorary Partner. In August, 2014, the Elbra Wedgworth Municipal Building was dedicated in her honor in the historic Five Points neighborhood for her service to the city of Denver and the state of Colorado. And so with all of that, <laughs> um, con I was about to say Congresswoman Wedgworth. Oh, no, no, Congresswoman no, no, no. Wedgworth. <laughs> oh, thank you. No, what do you think we, the biggest we, takeaway? We, 
Well, we thank you. We have one of those. We have a congresswoman, so thank you. But I appreciate it very much, Alisi, and the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, what really resonated with me in terms of the movie and what the takeaway was, was how committed he was to public service. And the work of public service is what motivated him. It kept him going when he had all of these, these hills to climb and when he was basically beaten down and, and the, it didn't seem like it would ever come to pass that they would ever accomplish anything. So it was the work that he saw that sustained him through everything. And it also laid the blueprint down for others to follow him because it was very important Indeed, Lewis and it wouldn't just be John Lewis. It would be many John Lewis's and a lot of other women and people of color and the underserved that would follow in his footsteps. But also mainly that he um, challenged injustice and he stood by his principles and you always stand by your principles. You don't let circumstances define you. You always define yourself. And that's the message you always sent regardless of civil rights and human rights and voting rights. He kept his principles in the forefront of everything he did. And I think that's the message yeah. that he left for young people to, to carry on his, his legacy. Yeah. So that's what I think. Yeah. It was inspiring to see, you know, members of the squad. It's interesting that they chose those three. Um, seeing his praises and basically say, you know, I wouldn't be here if there were no John Lewis, right? And so one of the things that I took away from the film, I have to say, you know, I watched it again last night um, because I wanted to pull out some of the quotes that I wrote down and couldn't find my notes. <laughs> this is what happens when you're ultra, ultra busy. But um, it's hope. Because I, you know, I don't know about you four, but I cried through it. I laughed through it. It was inspiring to see the hordes of people who, you know, know who he is. Like he can't walk through an airport without getting stopped, right? But at the end of the day, with all that he went through and all that we have gone through as a country and all that we go through every day as a people that after everything is said and done, there's still hope and that we have to remain hopeful because if we don't have hope, then we really will see the demise of our democracy. And so with that, one of the things that he said, I remember he was looking through um, some paperwork and he was sitting at his desk and he said, you know, one of my biggest fears is that I would wake up one day and find our democracy gone. And, um, Dean Mayor, you alluded to this. So I'm gonna start uh, with you, Dean Mayor, and then we will work our, our way backwards, boy, girl, boy, girl. What do you, I mean, do you think that we could really lose our democracy? And what would that look like? And have we come close? You know, it's, 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 it's amazing that we're even asking that question today, you know, uh, it, uh, and yet, it, we're, it's right to ask that question. And, and a short answer is, you know, democracies have always failed eventually. And, you know, the, the, the founders of this country and flawed as they were and imperfect as our democracy was and still is, recognized that it was uh, fragile, an experiment, a test. Uh, um, and we've sort of forgotten that. We've taken it for granted. I think, um, uh, absolutely, it, you know, it, it, it could happen here to paraphrase Sinclair Lewis. Um, and uh, I don't, uh, it, there is a resilience, there's a strength in the, in the democratic institutions, but there are, are clearly forces out there um, at a level that we haven't seen certainly and since uh, in, in my lifetime anyway, um, that are pushing against it. And and I'm particularly, I mean, my father was a Holocaust survivor and came to America after the war. So I hate Nazi <laughs> references, on, you know, kind of glibly made. And yet, um, you know, we have seen how democracies fail uh, there and many other places around the world. And I think uh, the notion that somehow we're immune to this is, 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 is false. And, and therefore, we have to 
put our shoulder to the wheel and continue to do the work yeah. of, of shoring up the democracy. Indeed, indeed. Councilwoman. Thank you. Um, I think that was the main takeaway I took from the election last year is that, you know, we can't assume because we've strived and we've made all these accomplishments over many decades that we should just say, okay, that's done, we're, we're good. Um, because a lot of those same fights related to women and healthcare and housing, um, a living wage, we're still fighting those things that he fought over 50 plus years ago. We're still fighting. Right. Them. And the one thing that I, I thought made me feel good about the election is that even though people were trying to uh, not want there to be any type of democracy, that people took it upon themselves to get people registered, get them to the polls. I mean, Georgia was a just incredible example. It's like, you are not going to take this. We are not going to let the lies in terms of the election just overcome us. You know, we are going to stand firm, uh, even despite the chaos at the Capitol. Our elected officials went back and did what they needed to do. And so, and that's right. there. And so I, I think that we can't take things for granted and there's always gonna be a struggle for change and peace in a peaceful society, which we all want. But we can't forget that we stood on the shoulders of a John Lewis and all these people that really, and some that died for this. And we can't forget that and pass that legacy on to the younger people going, let's not forget that it's always gonna be a struggle. And, yeah. But you're up yeah. to the task. Yeah. Power concedes nothing. Absolutely. Without a struggle. Yeah. Definitely. Director Mejia. You, you know, right now, there are 253 bills in 43 states designed to suppress the right to vote. Right. And so when, when we talk about the foundational right, the foundational what I consider to be a responsibility to vote and the accessibility and availability of that vote, that we, we are currently under siege in this country with regard to the idea, the very idea, the very foundation of democracy. And, you know, the, the Voting Rights Act, which now bears Congressman John Lewis's name, um, is designed to bring back what was at one point a very bipartisan Voting Rights Act in uh, all the way back in 1965. Um, you know, more, more recently gutted in, uh, by the Supreme Court in 2016. But the fact that, we, that that is coming back again and being reviewed again, and in the face of all the bills at a state level, that are designed to suppress the right to vote. Again, there's no time to rest. Um, and as no. my friend Benny Milner would say, uh, no, education no. is not a spectator sport and neither is democracy. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Uma? So I just want to echo the sentiments that everyone else mentioned. I think um, uh, the concept of a democracy is so sacred, um, especially in the US, but this phenomenon of um, the democracy slipping away is happening all around the world. We're seeing these trends happening um, in you know, somewhat linear and somewhat non-linear ways across the world. Um, but uh, we just have to remember that the civil rights struggle is still going on, just like um, Representative Diana Presley said. Um, and so we have to keep continuing to fight. Um, and it's somewhat colloquial said, but colloquially said, but until um, all of us are free, none of us are free. True that. Um, you know, and even here, um, Director Mejia, you brought up all of the legislation. On our last ballot, there was a question that said only citizens can vote. And I was fighting that tooth and nail. Um, as you know, I am the former president of Colorado Black Women for Political Action, and I put them on it. Um, they now have a new president, thank God. But I put them on it, and um, I called the NAACP and just the whole the whole Black crew, <laughs> y'all know who you are. 
And then, um, and then I, you know, I did zooms in on the Western slope and here and there. And I kept saying this, we cannot let this pass. It seems so innocuous. It seems so benign. Well, of course, citizens are, are the ones who vote. What else would we think? Right. And so people just check that box. Yeah, of course. And what do we have now? We have in the legislature as we speak, um, uh, a measure to require us to have a special voting ID and so the poll taxes begin. So never mind that my grandmother was not allowed to be born in a hospital, so she has no birth certificate to get this ID with. Never mind that. And anyone who grew up poor, like in Appalachia or anything it, prior to a certain year, probably didn't, you know, was not born in a hospital and they don't have the proper ID. And so the poll taxes begin, and that is the first step. One of the things, I don't know if you guys read um, about tyranny, no, on tyranny mm. by Schneider. And one of the things that he said was that, you know, we've, we've been hearing since the election of the 45th president that we have checks and balances in place that will protect our democracy. But nobody seemed to know what those checks and balances were, and they certainly did not stand strong. And so one of the things that he was saying is that we, the people, are the checks and balances, and there are and there are institutions that will help us with that, but we have to stand by that institution and protect that institution so that the checks and balances can actually check and balance, right? And, um, and, and here we are. So we have to make sure that that legislation doesn't pass, that we do not roll back the clock and go back to poll taxes and figuring out how many bubbles a, a bar of soap can produce. I never heard that one until I watched the movie, but goodness gracious. So, um, our, my next question, as we get questions in from the audience, um, is that Omar, you know, uh, Congresswoman Omar reminded us of something that John Lewis had said. And, um, and this just speaks to who he is, you know, when I was listening to him talking about that he, he'd show up with his Bible in his hand every day to school. Oh, my gosh. Um, I, I forgot to carry my Bible to church, much, <laughs> much less to school. So he said, we should love our country as we learn our, uh, as we love ourselves. We should love our country as we love ourselves. And, you know, I, I remember um, there, there have been plenty of people who have said this on air and everything else. But I remember asking my mom when I was young, why do they hate us so much? What did we do to make them, and I didn't even really know who them was at the time, you know, why do they hate us so much? And so the question that I have for you is how do we get to the point where black indigenous and other people of color who have been oppressed since the, since the beginning of this country, who have fought in every war, died in every war, who died defending this country, how? do we help folks love this country as much as we love ourselves? How do we help folks love a country that does not like them? And I will start with you, Uma. Thank you for this thoughtful question. Um, I'm going to be completely honest. I really struggle with it. Um, I think talking to many of my peers, um, and especially um, other students of color, um, it's hard to love the country, especially when the country doesn't love us back. Um, and I think um, this is really where a generational shift kind of comes in. Um, my parents immigrated here from India um, and not necessarily in search of the American dream, but um, that's a conception that many people hold um, and they came here for this reason. Um, and I think I struggle reconciling where that line kind of falls where, um, you know, America is the land of opportunities and there are so many things to learn. There's so much momentum, so many things to offer. Um, yet how do we keep the movement going so that we don't revert and we um, you know, move in the right direction um, so that everyone does have the right to vote, everyone can access healthcare um, and access all of these basic human rights that um, other people come to the United States in search of. Yep, 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 definitely, definitely. I'm gonna move on to Director Mejia. You know, J James Baldwin said that I, I love America more than any other country in the world. And exactly for this, for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her. 
and, and other, otherwise stated, I, I, I think when you are passionate about the place where you live, not only do you in, should you insist on the right to criticize her, but you must, and 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 it you must perpetually. Um, that that has to be a, a process that never stops, and the process of improvement, and the process of inclusion, and the process of hearing all voices, which add to the democracy, is not a time limited action. I mean, n- n- never more in our history has it has it been more true that this is a democracy of the people. Uh, and we're reminded that this is, that this is definitely for the people and, and um, but it, but it has to be of the people. It's gotta be by the people, uh, you know, and, and, you know, to, back to your point, Halisi, that we are the check and balance. We, we are the ultimate check and balance, uh, which is why the, the right to vote is so incredibly important. Uh, but also the, the obligation to be involved in, uh, the, the political scene, even just as citizen with your local community, is dramatically and profoundly important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Councilwoman? Well, I think we always accomplish something working together and we can't keep our minds and our hearts in silos. And so I really feel that we have to communicate, we have to network, keep informed, educate ourselves on issues and pass on that knowledge that you have to younger people. Because to tell you a small story, I met a young man when he was 18 years old. He was a a student at Manuel High School, which is my alma mater. And he was just very bright. I thought he was gonna be going places. And you know, that's why you always have to be nice to young people like Uma, because you never know where they're gonna end up, right? And so (laughs) years later, long story short, that young man is Mayor Michael Hancock. And so you basically helped plant that seed and you encouraged them throughout those years to get into leadership, to not be afraid because John Lewis, he was a young man when all this started. He was in his early twenties, Washington and all that. That was such a brave thing to do, but also that the more seen, seasoned and, 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 and older people allowed this young man to take that stand and to make and, and make his mark that that was okay because they realized it wasn't just about them it was about future generations like John Lewis and after him so that's another thing we have to acknowledge is that this is a fight not only for you this is for everybody including the future people that you'll never meet years from now decades yeah. from now so yeah. yeah definitely most definitely Dean Mayor that's a hard question you asked. And you know, one of the things I was just so struck by in the film, you know, first the the incredible love John Lewis had for the country, as I think someone said, you, you know, love more than it did, America more than it deserved to be loved. Uh, and and the, the kind of optimism in, in, inherent in that uh, was was striking. Another thing that that um, it was just, uh, I, I always marvel when I see the footage of, of uh, uh, Dinesh and, and Jim Lawson and the training in Nashville. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. I can't even imagine what it would have been like to be at a lunch counter and, and have the, those, those, you know, that the, you look at the faces of hate behind them and throwing things and it's just pure hate. The, the discipline and the fortitude I mean I can't even understand it to not only not react but to but somehow to love those people um, are, is extraordinary um, and I, you know of course there was a debate in the movement as to you know the about nonviolence and 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 you saw briefly you saw Malcolm X there and and you know that was and um, but to me that that um, that profound optimism that love could prevail, uh, that you could get to the beloved community that uh, King spoke of, uh, is just such a it's a powerful, powerful thing. And I don't know if we can get there, but I, it, you know, the only chance I think we have is to listen to each other, to hear each other's stories, to to the best of our ability to try to put ourselves in the shoes of others, 
uh, and and to love each other. And uh, you know, he was uh, Lewis was just such a profound example of that. Yeah, you know, it, 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 that leads to my next question. It was interesting to see that um, that tension um, between that that was just kind of alluded to. We know it more uh, through other uh, historical accounts between those who were believed in the nonviolence movement and then those who were like uh, like some of the young folks today is like, no, we want change now and we want it drastic. We, we're tired of these half measures. We're tired of the baby steps towards progress um, because we've been suffering too long. And it's the whole, you know, you've taken a knife, knife out six inches, but I'm still bleeding and I'm still wounded, right? Um, and I think who else was in there? Uh, Stokely Carmichael or Kwame Ture. And so the, one of the questions that I have for you all, and I'm gonna start with you, uh, Councilwoman, is understanding where we are today. Like they only knew what they knew in the 50s and 60s. They only knew what they knew and they could not even possibly conceive that we would have had Barack Obama and Kamala Harris in the White House um, within a decade span. And it seems to me that with the, Stuff really has to be bad in America when you elect the person of color. That's just what I've seen. I don't know. I, I might be wrong about that. But do you think that we can get to change um, simply with the philosophy of MLK and John Lewis, or or do we need both? Well, and I, and how does that relate to what we see today and what happened over the summer with the Black Lives Matters protests? Well, I personally think that um, back in the day that they did think that that's what would happen. They, they laid the foundation for that. They're like, we are sacrificing this for you to take it further. And then further than that and further than that. And so they saw the, the creation of their work and their sacrifice and their, and their colleagues that were beaten and, and, and killed. They're just like, we're doing this and we're going through all of this for you and you and you, because we can see the future and it's not gonna be like this forever because we can see the different steps that we're taking to make it better. But you have to lay the foundation first. You just can't have, oh, okay, we want this to happen and that's the way it's gonna be. Because violence for me, it's never really gotten anywhere. I mean, it's taken thoughtful, a strategic work and dedication to get us where we need to go as, as a people. And I think that that's been proven time and time again. I get where the young people are coming from because it's frustrating the way they've been treated and how we're looked upon as a people, but we, we've overcome and we'll continue to overcome all that because we have a, a bigger picture to go towards. And we have to just keep that vision. It's that light you see that nobody else sees and that community we have, to, we have to continue to see it because that's what's gonna make us get there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, Director Mejia. I, I think this was one of the toughest issues in the film and one of the toughest issues for me personally, as I navigate uh, public policy and the desire to change. Um, I share, the sentiment of impatience. Um, however, I, I reflect on uh, the level of forgiveness that I have seen from someone like a Nelson Mandela or um, uh, someone like John Lewis, who, 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 who has this eternal spring of, of hope and optimism about the ability to overcome through love. I, I confess that I don't feel like I have that, that well, uh, that, that level in, uh, uh, of reserve uh, to be able to supersede um, just through love. Um, I, I think that is a, an incredibly special individual that can, uh, that can draw from that well and, and have that kind of optimism and such a solid spiritual core 
that provides, I, I, I think, the uh, you know the, the the essence of 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 how he how he talks about civil rights and how he talks about public service. Um, it, it's another level. It's a it's a deeper level. And and I you know, I've I've got to say I I haven't reached that level for you know just personally. I, I share the impatience. Um, and and so for me, I I I, I see both sides. I see the importance for perpetual forgiveness and and uh, you know perpetual love and and nonviolence. However, I I see the the need to be impatient. I see the need to push harder and farther and further uh, without relent. And um, I. For me, this is the toughest question of the day. It was the toughest question posed in the film, um, and and it and it's a personal struggle uh, for for me. Uh, Halisi, can I beg to this a short rebuttal because I'm not going to let James Mejia talk about my friend like that uh, because I know James Mejia and I know what type of a man he is, and I think that he's not giving himself <laughs> credit or he wouldn't be who he is. So. You know, I understand what he's saying, but I think that he's proven through his public service who he is as a person and the people that he basically passes on, passes that on to. So, <laughs> so it, it's always nice to have someone else sing your praises. I'm going to tell you, the the priest who did my confirmation would tell you, yeah, how they see you are not a John Lewis. Uh, and I can't even see a John Lewis in the making because I wanted to argue with him about why I should go to confession and shouldn't it just be enough that God is forgiving me and why do I need, so yeah, <laughs> I'm not the one. <laughs> Uma, what do you think? Yeah, I certainly, um, I believe in the power of being forgiving um, and following the path of nonviolence, but um, like James mentioned, I think I definitely see both sides. Um, Representative yeah. Ocasio Cortez yeah. mentioned um, that these protests, um, you know, in part happened because of the inaction on the part of the government. And um, when you keep pushing those boundaries and keep asking minoritized communities to, you know, hold off or concede or um, wait longer, um, it, it builds up. And um, at what point, um, I guess, do we have to set a new norm? Um, so I think that. It's a difficult question, um, especially in the world that we live in today where black and brown bodies are constantly criminalized. And as we saw in the movie, um, you know, protesters were peacefully outside the buildings, but they were still attacked with violence. Um, so I think it's a difficult question. Um, and I would like to think that um, love and dialogue can, um, you know, help bridge that gap. Um, but I think that there needs to be tactics that, um, you know, that we agree upon. And maybe one of those things is that setting that norm that violence has a zero tolerance policy um, and put our money where our mouth is for that. Yeah. The other thing that she said that in action, um, AOC said, is an action, mm. right? That is an action. And, and so the, the federal government decided that yes, these black people should be beaten and hosed and bitten with dogs. Our federal government who is supposed to protect us sanctioned those actions by their inaction. And she said his actions highlighted the inaction of our government. And I believe the actions of the young people this summer highlighted the inaction of our governments across the nation in protecting us, right? Um, so yeah, definitely. Dean Mayer. Well, just to just to build exactly on that point, I mean, it was nonviolent direct action. So there was a fierce urgency to John Lewis. You know, John Lewis and Hosea Williams marched before King got there because they were impatient. Um, so there, there. It, it's not like they were waiting around, but it was. Um, yeah. It was, um, I mean, among other things, Lewis King were brilliant political strategists and in the best. Oh my gosh. And, uh, 
summarized in King's letter from Birmingham jail, that the purpose of nonviolent direct action is to so dramatize the situation that a community that has failed to recognize is forced to confront that those the purpose and indeed exactly the point you just made that was the that's what Black Lives Matter is doing. It is forcing it is bringing it is forcing the issue. Um, now, uh, Black Lives Matter was not violent and there were violence that happened alongside, et cetera, that's been conflated in, 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 uh, and, and, on, you know, to my eye, as just as a matter of pure political strategy, that's unfortunate. Uh, the brilliance uh, and to me of, of, of those moments in the civil rights era was, was, was that it was, I mean, it was aggressive. It was forcing this issue, uh, but in a very particular way, in a way that, um, again, to, to use the word, to dramatize the situation in ways that compelled or made it more compelling um, and that built a you know, much larger coalition. So um, I, I, you know, it is right to be angry. It is right to protest. It is right to call those things out. But when you, when you the understanding that uh, all those uh, folks in Nashville understood was that if you if you strike back, it's all too easy for others to just tell the story. Well, both sides, you know, a riot broke right. out, a fight broke out, right? And so they were very, very, very cognizant of the way in which the narrative would would be told. And um, to me, that's 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 the more promising path. The, the unfortunate part is, is that you had to be so clever and so strategic just to get the right thing done. Yeah, well, that the right thing just couldn't be done because it's the right thing. No. That you had to strategize and, and put the children up front and then wear a suit and, 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 yeah. and. No. Well, as you said, power doesn't uh, give up, you know, power you know, tends not to give it up. Um, um, but yes, it, it, I mean, would that it was not so that, that. Yeah, true, truly, truly. Um, I, I, do I have still no questions? Wow. Okay. I guess I'm asking good questions then. And, and the audience is like, well, what more is there to ask? Great. Well, I do have another uh, question and, um, and it's kind of following up on this because you know, my, my parents were very involved in the civil rights movement. And, um, and so I, some of that footage I remember seeing, and in those days we had to see it at the movie theater, right? <laughs> there was no YouTube, there was no streaming, and it certainly wasn't shown on broadcast news. But back in those days, there was a part of the FBI, there was a project called COINTELPRO. Most Americans don't know about COINTELPRO and, 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 and um, not COINTELPRO, just COINTEL. And then what's interesting is, is that, um, is that in the movie, they never brought that up. But yet we know that the FBI infiltrated the movement, both SNCC and, um, and Martin Luther King's uh, movement and that part of the organization, as well as the later following the Black Panthers, and the US organization that created Kwanzaa um, that what my parents were involved in. And, you know, growing up, you know, my house was buzzed, our phones were tapped and all of that. And they were trying to, you know, they basically took away my father's security pass. Um, he was a, a, an engineer for the aerospace industry. And so these were the things that were going on at the time. What legislation do we need to put forth? Because we've got public policy folks here uh, in our panel. What kind of legislation do we need to put forth so that we're not, so that the federal government, or do we, or is it just about um, instituting and putting teeth behind what already exists and actually, you know, following the law so that when we have movement, we don't have our own government working against it? And, and then I want to add on to that as we're in our last 15 to 10 minutes. One of the things that he kept saying throughout the movie is saving the soul of America. And we heard that with our current president as well. We need to save the soul of America. So we have on the one hand where the federal government was 
actually aiding in the destruction of progress. And we saw that again in 2016, right? And then we have both then and now our leaders saying that we need to save the soul of America. What do they mean by that? And what policies need to be instituted to make sure that we don't see a January 6th happen again and that we don't move further back? And I will start with Director Mejia. You know, I I think the first thing we need to do is be involved in uh, electoral politics so that uh, the elected composition of of everybody at the at the municipal state and federal levels mirror the constituency which is not true right now Um, and i think it's very difficult for a population that does not look like the rest of the country to all of a sudden wake up and discover that change needs to be made Uh, in order to, to make that kind of change i think you need to diversify electoral politics Uh, and change it from the inside. Um, I also think that that is true in corporate America. I think it's true in nonprofit America. Um, I think it's it's true in educational America, uh, religious America. There needs to be a a seismic shift in who represents us. Um, and, And our representatives need to be more representative of who we are as a constituency. So that's the first thing I, I, I would say is that, um, that there are changes that, that have got to be made from the inside in terms of, of who is representing us. Um, uh, the second thing I, I, I would say is we have got to build very broad coalitions. Um, and e- even even folks who may not be partners on one issue could very well be partners on another issue. And I've always been a fan of um, a very diverse set of friends, some some of whom I agree with uh, a lot of the time and some of of whom I I don't agree with um, very much, but still keep them close, learn from them, listen to them, try to understand perspectives, that that kind of thing. and, and sometimes you can pull together coalitions when you're working on, on, on things that may be very unlikely. Uh, so I think it's, it's incredibly important to broaden the umbrella, listen to diverse ideas, uh, and put things in, into yeah. in place. Um, I don't know. Th- those, are, those are my first couple thoughts. Great. I love it. I love it. Uma. Yes, I absolutely agree that we need more um, representation. Um, And I think along with that, um, the big piece for me is um, community-based education. I think that we need to have more resources out there, um, especially for the youth. Start kids and students in college um, young. Uh, They're the ones that are going to be going out, um, you know, going back home, telling their parents, their grandparents about what they see at school, what they see in the community. Um, and I think that's the first step, um, especially when it comes to getting the voice out about the vote. Um, and as we saw with um, Stacey Abrams and her whole team, uh, I don't think enough praise can be given to her um, just for the immense work that they put into getting all of um, the community out, especially with uh, minoritized communities. Um, so it's really about uh, connecting people on that one-on-one level um, so that you do, so that they do have the resources um, to know where to go yeah. and what is available to them. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it was Congresswoman Presley who said those who are closest to pain need to be closest to power. I find it interesting that Congress has 68, 60 plus percent, somewhere in there are white males, and yet they only make up 34% of the electorate. There's one group in America where the majority of them voted for the 45th president to be reelected. There's one group where the majority, that means they said, yes, yes, our norms don't matter. Yes, black lives don't matter. Yes, more kids in cages. Yes, people don't deserve health care. That's what they were saying with their vote. I mean, our vote is a statement of our values, right? And so as, as, as Chief Mejia was saying, yeah, no permanent enemies, just permanent values. 
and we can work with all types of people to get things done. How do we save the soul of America? How do we do that, Councilwoman? Well, I agree with James. I think that um, having our elected leadership, whether it's on the city level, county, state, or federal, but also on their staffs, there's equity in terms of people that they're representing is critical. Also, um, we have to look at other issues like judges, judgeships, you know, because people are passing laws and they are basically bringing people in to judge them in terms of, you know, um, not only their behavior, but just basically laws that are, are passed and policies that are passed. I think that we need to sustain what we have and not let anything be taken away, but build on it. And uh, we're getting challenges for the Voting Rights Act. We have to stand firm about that. We are like, no, this is where we came and we're, keep, we're keeping it going. We're not gonna allow you to take it away from us. And also, um, we need to just challenge, you know, if, if like John Lewis said, if we see something wrong, we need to say something. We can't just, you know, lay back and just leave it up to other people. We need to build coalitions and say, you will not take this away from us. You are not going to take the election uh, from 2020 away from us. We're not going to allow you to do that. And that's the message that we send as America and to the world. That's, that's what we built on. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that, right. that's, um, that we do that. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Last but certainly not least, Dr. Dean, Mayor. <laughs> well, you'd asked, uh, you know, what what is meant by battle for the soul of America? And, you know, that's a it's a pretty abstract idea, but you know, mm -hmm. it, I think it, at its heart, it's it's you know, what kind of what kind of people are we? What kind of a, a community will we be? Will we? You know, um, we've always been a kind of a dream, uh, an idea, an idea, uh, and a constant striving uh, up and down, failure to to reach, to be sure. But those those grand ideals that all men, all people are created equal, that we have government of, by and for the people. Um, this is what I agree with everything that's been said. Um, but it's that that sort of remembering what we are. Where, where are we going? What are we trying to do? What are we trying to become? It seems to me that's in danger. We've lost track of that grand narrative. That was, you know, that was the heart of the, the narrative. I mean, the brilliance of the narrative of the civil rights movement was to, was to align that movement with the, with the American story as a, as a sort of constant uh, upward battle towards ever greater freedom, et cetera, for with all its flaws, et cetera. So I think that you know, that is, is in some ways what is meant. Now, how to do that, I mean, one is rhetorically just to remind us to call us back to those principles and that matters. Leadership matters a lot. And we've seen the counterfactual here where leadership can take us in terrible directions. But I would add one, you know, just to add one more piece to this in terms of public policy, yet the Voting Rights Act, the, uh, you know, working hard to think about the way in which our electoral system uh, works to enable greater diversity. Um, there are different voting schemes, for example, that tend to, to uh, but, you know, do that better than, than the ones that we have. But I would put in the economic piece here. Um, and as you know, as, as King was doing at the end of his life, um, you yep. know, the, the, the enormous disparity of wealth and it, it, in particular, uh, which is, you know is this is this legacy of our system? I mean, it's one thing to talk about opportunity, but in a you know we we economic mobility in the U.S. is among the lowest of all the advanced it's, it, you know economies in the world. You know, to, uh, without that, you know, some ways the American dream rings, rings hollow. And so I think, in addition to all of the th things that were said. We have a lot of work to do in public policy to work on, on the quality of economic opportunity because uh, without that, uh, I think it's, it's, it's much more difficult to make progress on, on, on the other issues. On the other front. Yeah. I agree with you wholeheartedly. My previous life, um, I was helping transform businesses from closely held, privately held to employee owned. Um, 
because I truly believe that one of the reasons why we're in the predicament that we're in is because of this huge wealth gap. If folks don't have hope, if there is nothing to be lost by doing whatever, then you get extremism. And whether that extremism takes the form of, I don't know, charging the capital of the United States of America and demanding the vice president and thinking that you're going to hang them by a noose, or if it looks like Bloods and Crips, or if it looks like someone in the Middle East who is um, who is uh, what we would term a terrorist. Either way it goes, when you feel like that you have nothing and that all hope is lost, you you start reaching for it, right? And so I, I'm not under, I, I don't really understand why we have gotten to the place where it's okay to work 40 hours and still be in poverty. I don't understand why we have to subsidize the business model of, or, of companies that can't afford to pay your folks a living wage. I, I just don't understand that. So as far as public policy, I'll close with this. I, I have two, three suggestions. One is my economic one, because I'm all about wealth building. And uh, those who, who help create the wealth should enjoy the wealth. And every worker from the receptionist to the greeter at some of those stores on up to the CEO is creating wealth for that company. And they should all enjoy that, not just trading their time for money. The second thing is, is I think we need to put the teeth back in the Federal Communications Commission. Anyone who's seen me do these webinars know I'm going to bring this up because we have so-called news organizations that are not news and they are spaces for conspiracy theory and lies that has, has turned 74 million Americans into folks who don't understand that we just had a free and fair election. They think that it was not free and fair, right? We have folks who believe that there are folks in some basement somewhere, then they're, you know, I don't know, um, Satan worshipers and eating children and doing all of this weird nonsense, you know, at the top of our government. I mean, this is witchcraft and conspiracy theories at its best. So we need a federal communications. We need to reinstitute re the fairness doctrine. So we actually have truth in what is being promoted out there. And then lastly, we need to change our curriculum nationwide to include the, the lives of every American that contributed to this country. Right now, slavery gets two paragraphs. You know, the internment of Japanese gets a paragraph, et cetera, et cetera. And so no wonder we have people who don't understand people who don't look like them. They don't know us, you know? We don't know each other. And yet we're all Americans and we've all done so much to make this country great. And, and, and the vast majority of Americans don't even realize it. So I'd like to see a national, these are long-term changes. This is not an overnight flip the switch, put the teeth back in the Voting Rights Act. This is like changing the hearts and minds of Americans. Because once we know that we all belong to each other, then we can start developing that love that John Lewis was talking about and really have a love revolution that makes sure that no American is left behind and that we do become our brother and our sister's keepers. Great discussion, folks. Great discussion. And with that, namaste. I love you all. I love all of you out there. And um, when I ran my campaign, I talked about a love revolution. Folks thought I was crazy. But it is that love that keeps us fighting. The great Gloria Tanner says, don't quit. Change it from the inside. And that's what we're all doing. So thank you all for participating. And our call to action is to make sure that you hold your electives accountable, pay attention, protect those institutions that you want to protect that you know are creating the checks and balances. And always, every year, vote, 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 like your life depends on it, because it might. And with that, good night. Thank you. Thank you all. Such a pleasure. Oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I love it. I love it. Right. Thank you.